fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that are on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, I pray that you will teach us today from your word how to be strong, godly fathers. We love you, Lord, and praise your holy name. Amen. In our society today, uh, to be honest with you, um, probably the most looked down upon group of people in society today are fathers. They're made fun of in just about every aspect of things. They're made fun of in family groups. If you watch most family shows, it's the father that's the dunce, the father that can't do this, the father that can't do that, the father that has no wisdom. Fathers are just kind of looked down upon in society today. They're looked at as almost as being irrelevant. You know, people today think that you know, there's, there's people today having families and they don't even want fathers in the family because they think fathers are irrelevant. Well, fathers are not irrelevant. In fact, the premise of the sermon today is, is that the key to any successful family is a godly father. The key to any successful family is a godly father. I mean, that's the key. If you look at our country today, our country today is, uh, is in moral shambles. Our country today has no moral direction, no spiritual direction. That's not by accident. That's because the influence of godly men has almost evaporated from our society. Men have begun to believe the things that they're hearing about themselves on, on TV and, in, and on PCs, that from PC people, etc. They're starting to believe that about themselves, that they are irrelevant and they're just out for themselves and just out to, for this and that and the other. But I'll tell you right now that the only way that our country can survive, the only way that our families can survive is by godly fathers and you see, most families, most people think, I think today, when you have Mother's Day, they think that the cornerstone of every family group is the mother. And indeed, mothers are beyond necessary. But the cornerstone of every successful family is not the mother. It's the father. If you look what Jesus said, you know, if every man would leave his father and mother and become his own individual family group. If you go to any wedding, has anybody ever been to any weddings? Any weddings? Okay. In every wedding, do they give the groom to the bride or do they give the bride to the groom? You see, because scripturally, and even Jesus says this in Ephesians chapter 5, every man leaves his father and mother and establishes his own family group. That makes him the cornerstone of that family. And then in the service, they say, who now comes to give uh, this woman to this man? And this other family group gives their daughter to become part of this brand new family group that is built upon the cornerstone of this husband, this man, this father. And that is how God set things up. And when God sets something up, that's how things should be done. Amen? And when society gets to be a mess, it's because they've abandoned God's truth. But the truth of God's plan is, is that the cornerstone of every family is the man. Now, what's it take to be a godly dad? Let's talk about that. What's it take to be a godly dad? First of all, a godly dad has to be saved. That means he has to have made Jesus Christ the Lord of his life. In order to be saved, we confess Jesus to be our Lord and we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Every godly man, he can't be a godly man if he hasn't given his heart and his life to Jesus. Amen? The next thing is, that godly man is not just saved, but he's connected to Jesus. He's connected to Jesus in all his decision making. He's, just, he's connected to Jesus in prayer. He's connected to Jesus in Bible study. He's connected to Jesus in everything. When he needs advice, he's connected to Jesus. The next thing is, is that a godly man is obedient to Jesus and obedient to his Lord. He obeys God's laws. He obeys the word of God. 
He obeys Christ. He is obedient. And He demonstrates to His children the fear of the Lord. You say, well, children aren't supposed to be afraid of their parents. Really? Really? How can a child learn to be, have the fear of the Lord if he doesn't understand to be respectful and fearful of his parents? In our society today, you listen to this now, in our society today, families are being put down by nearly every public education system that's out there. I don't think some teachers, I mean, a lot of teachers are so young and they just don't have the experience and a lot of them don't have their own family they don't understand it, but they, they'll even tell children that, that, listen, you don't have to listen to your dad. You don't have to listen to your mom. You don't have to listen to your family group. You're your own individual person. If you don't like what they're telling you, you come tell us and we'll deal with it. If you don't think, if you don't think that's occurring in schools today, here in Atlanta, Georgia, here in Gwinnett County, here in Cobb County, and all the counties in this area, if you don't think that's occurring in schools today, then you're a very naive person. Because it absolutely is. Society, for whatever reason, has decided that society can take care of people, but the family unit is not necessary. And the fear of the Lord is not necessary. And the fear of the family unit is not necessary. I love my dad beyond comprehension. But buddy, when I was a kid, I feared my dad. Not in a bad way either. In a good way. But my mom said, your dad will deal with you when he gets home tonight. And I knew exactly what that meant. Let's go on. A godly dad is strong in the Lord. He understands that the battles that we fight in this world. You ever had a financial struggle? You've had a financial struggle, say amen. Ever had a medical problem? Say amen. Ever had any kind of struggle? Say amen. We don't wrestle. Uh, a godly man understands that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. Every single battle we fight in this world is a spiritual battle. Therefore, since the man is the protector of the family group, he has to understand how to do spiritual warfare. And the way you do spiritual warfare is by being strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So a godly dad is strong in the Lord and the power of God's might, not his own might. Responsibility. A godly dad recognizes and accepts his responsibility to his family. Number one, he puts the needs of his family before his own needs. I wouldn't give you two bits for a man that puts his own needs above the needs of his family. His family, I'm not just talking about finances, I'm talking about the needs of his family. Children need to be around their dads. Children need the guidance of their fathers in a lot of different areas. They need that emotional stability. They need that spiritual guidance. And when a man decides that he's got to do his own thing and he's got to live his own life and he doesn't have time to do that, I, don't give, I, won't, I won't give you two bits for that guy. He may be a male, but he's not a father, amen? Because father put the needs of their family above their own personal needs. You don't like that? Don't become a dad. Because that is your responsibility to take care of your family and take care of your children. Number two, to provide for all the needs of his family, spiritual, emotional, financial. If your family is a spiritual mess, Dad, it's your responsibility to straighten it out. If it's a financial mess, Dad, it's your responsibility to straighten it out. If your family is in emotional distress, it's your responsibility to straighten it out. It is the Dad's responsibility. Number three, to protect his family from all dangers, spiritual, emotional, and physical. It is not always a fun thing to protect your children from danger. Because most of the time, your children are so young, they want to do this, they want to do that, they want to do this, they want to do that, and they do not recognize the dangers. But you're responsible for recognizing the dangers. And when you see the dangers, you've got to stop your kids right where they are. If you see a two-year-old heading at full speed down the sidewalk toward a public street, are you just going to stand there and say, well, he just likes to run a lot? Are you just going to do that? Or are you going to run out there and tackle the kid before he gets to the street? Yeah, tackling the kid might hurt him a little bit, but it keeps him from becoming a greasy spot on the highway. That's what I used to tell my kids when they wouldn't.
that had to hold my hand in the parking lot or they wouldn't hold my hand going across the street, I tell them, say, hey, this is one of those breezy spots on the street. That's kids that didn't hold up to their parents' hands when they crossed the highway. And to this day, <laughs> to this day, you know, when they you know, when we come up to a parking lot, they say, you wouldn't believe what dad used to tell us about those breezy spots on the highway. It worked, though. See, sometimes we have to anger our children, not intentionally to make them mad, but sometimes we're going to make them mad by restricting what they do. Now, that's a foreign thought in society today, isn't it? Restrict what children can do. Oh my gosh. How awful is that? First thing you ought to do is take your cell phones away from them. I'll tell you that right now. The evil that is invading every home in this nation is through cell phones. You say, well, Brother Don, you're just old and cantankerous this morning. No, that is an absolute fact. I was somewhere that night, I forget where it was. I think I was ordering Thai. And I walked in to get it and I had to wait. And I looked around this restaurant. Just filled with families. I would estimate conservatively 75% of the people in that restaurant, men, women, children, were looking at their cell phones. They weren't talking to each other. They weren't, you know, telling funny stories or talking about their day. They were looking at their cell phones. Now you tell me that that's normal. That's an addiction. If you don't think it's an addiction, just leave your cell phone in. Just leave your cell phone off. Or go get you one of those clunky cell phones that you can't do anything except answer the phone number. And just do that for a month. If you don't think cell phones are addictive. Why does a kid need a smartphone? All he's got to be able to do is hit three buttons. You know, to either call home, to dial 911, or whatever. And that's all he needs. He doesn't have to have a smartphone to do this and that and the other. Play 27 different kind of games on that smartphone. If you give a kid a smartphone with 27 different kind of games, you're never going to hear it from him. Because all he's going to do is play those games. Let's go on. I've picked on the cell phone too much. Number four, to encourage his family in tough times, in sad times, in dark times. And to teach his family that with God all things are possible. Every single human that has ever lived on this earth or will ever live on this earth is going to have hard times. If they're going to have hope in God, if they're going to have hope in Jesus, they have to be taught that there's hope in Jesus. And that's the dad's responsibility. The dad has to say, man, I know things are tough right now. Things are tough right now. We've got to pull together right now, but I promise you that God will come through. God will come through. God will come through. God will come through. And these children will learn that when they get into tough times and dad's no longer around and mom's no longer around, that God will come through. It'll just be something that's emblazoned in their mind that their dad taught them that God always comes through. And God does always come through. Amen? Always. He's never late. He's always right on time. And he always comes through. Last one. A godly man is responsible to teach his family to trust and hope in God's provisions and promises. A godly man needs to teach them that God loves them all the time. And that love is never failing. That they can never be separated from the love of God. He needs to teach them that God is always working everything in their life out for the good. They have a disappointment. Dad, I don't understand I don't understand either. But the Bible promises that God is working all things for the good of those that love Him, that trust Him, that have been chosen to serve Him. Do you love God? Yes, Dad, I love God. Then trust God that He's working all things out for your good. Kids need to be taught how to face disappointment. And that, that, that disappointment can be overcome by belief and faith in the promises of God. That kids need to be promised and be taught that no matter what's happening in their life, that the love of God for them is never failing and is never separated from them. Nothing can overcome the love of God for each one of us. No matter what you are going through, no matter what you've gone through, God loves you. God's love of you never ceases. A lot of people think that when they're having a bad time that God's quit loving them. Baloney! You're just having a bad time. We live on an awful planet that has been corrupted by sin. It is everywhere. It has infected everything that's happening in this world. When 
you're having a bad time, you're just, it's just the world getting after you. But it's not God. God loves you. And no matter what the world can try to do to you, God will work all of those things out for good. You say, I don't believe that. You've got to believe that. And it's the responsibility of your father to teach you that. How about marriage? A godly dad recognizes that his responsibility is to make his marriage work. We were at Promise Keepers. I think I told you the story, but I'm getting older and I forget what story I told you, which one I haven't told you. But we're at the first Promise Keepers meeting that we took about 40 guys from our church to down in Memphis, Tennessee. You knew it was going to be a special event when you pulled into the welcome station and uh, you stopped to go to the restroom and there were more men waiting for the men's restroom than the women's restroom. You knew right then something special was happening in Memphis. Amen. And we got there and uh, powerful powerful event. All the men were affected, but one in particular, a friend of mine that actually wasn't a member of our church, but he was a friend of mine getting on with us. He'd been having trouble in his family. He'd been having trouble in his marriage in particular. Real serious trouble. To be honest with you, I kind of felt like it was really a wife's responsibility and wife's problem that the type of problem they were having was basically centered around her. But he was transformed that meeting. And he took responsibility for that marriage. And they stuck together. In fact, their marriage so bloomed and grew that they became their active foreign missionaries to this land. Their marriage went from being on the rocks to being on the rock because the husband took responsibility to have a good marriage. Men, if you're having trouble with marriage, it's your fault. If you don't believe that, ask me why. But it really is. Let's go on. I can preach a whole sermon on that. I don't have time for that. A godly dad knows where to have, ask for help. He asks for help from God. And he believes that he's going to receive that help. Next one. A godly man does not quit. If you're a man, you're going to fail as a man. If you're a dad, you're going to fail sometimes as a dad. If you're a husband, you're going to fail a lot of times as a husband. Don't quit. You dust yourself off. You ask forgiveness for whoever you messed up, whatever you did wrong. You dust yourself off. You get up. And you just keep on keeping on. You keep on trying to be the best dad that you can be. You keep on trying to be the best husband you can be. You keep on being the most godly man that you can be. Has anybody, has anybody in this congregation today, did anybody in this congregation today not sin at all last week? If you did, I'll sit down and you stand up and you preach. Anybody? No, not me either. We all sin. I think we all failed last week. Does that mean because we failed at some point last week that we quit being a Christian? Does that mean that we quit trying to be godly? Does that mean we quit trying? Do we quit trying? No! A godly man never quits. Now, how can we help godly men be godly men? I've got ten things. First of all, in the church. <coughs> a failing of mine here, I'll take responsibility for this. We do not have a good men's ministry. I have no excuses. We do not have a good men's ministry. Every church needs to have a good men's ministry. These have a good women's ministry too. We don't have that either. I'm not taking responsibility for that. But I'll take responsibility for us not having a good men's ministry. We need to change that. We've got new, young, vibrant ministers coming on the field here. They are filled with the power of God. They are filled with all kinds of excitement. they got all kinds of energy that this old guy up here doesn't have. Maybe they can help us start a great men's ministry. That'd be cool. Next of all, every man Listen now, if you're listening, say amen. You better get this. Every man needs to have one or two guys that he can trust that are also trying to be godly men that he can be accountable to. You don't want a bunch of guys. You don't want a meeting. You want one or two guys that are trying to be godly men just like you are that you can be accountable to. It says over there in James chapter 5, confession of faults one to another. Confession of faults. Confession of failure. Confession of challenges. Confession of temptation. You need somebody you can speak that out loud. Listen to me. You listen. If you
you don't have somebody that you can confess things to out loud, Satan will get the best of you. When you confess your faults, when you confess your failures, when you confess your temptations out loud to another human being that you trust, you just took all the power out of Satan's hands. Every man needs a couple of guys can call the phone and say, hey, how's it going? <clears throat> man, I've had a challenge today, brother. Tell me about it. <clears throat> well, I'll pray for you. You pray for me. Let's try to do better the rest of the day. Okay. Except that's it. Every man should have got guys like that. Every man ought to have two guys like that. Make sure you trust the guys. Make sure they're not quiet about us. Girls, you really need to do the same thing. Be careful who you choose. If you want to be a godly man, don't choose an ungodly man to be the person you confide in. Make sure it's a godly man. Make sure the guy that you confide in, in your estimation, is godlier than you can ever be. That'd be perfect. Let's go on. <clears throat> Respect. In the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Why do you obey your husbands? And I know a lot of folks have taken that out of the marriage vows, but hey, it's his family group, amen. So what do wives, what do husbands want in return? Respect. What is that also? R E S B C
demonstrating to them how to survive in this world. <clears throat> Last thing my dad said to me. October 17, 1979. He'd been in the hospital for about six weeks with cancer. He'd been having cancer for about four years. And it was that time when the doctor said nothing we could do for him. He the hospital with God. And that's what they did. Kind of what? That's what happened. And he was just on the edge of going into a coma. And it was on a Wednesday night. And I was worn out. And I was going to leave. And I went over and leaned over the bed. And I said, Dad, I... Lord, I need you.